Welcome to my site of support and understanding association and the pain is not a four lettered word webinar. Uh, my name is Jerry Williams and I am the founder and president of MSU, Myositis Support Understanding. And I've been living with what's now classified as dermatomyositis for over 18 years. And pain was my very first symptom and continues to be in my say top three um, most disabling things about myositis followed by fatigue and muscle weakness. Um, at MSU, we work to improve the lives of and empower myositis patients and caregivers. And as we look at improving patients' lives, which is really what we focus on, and while not everyone experiences pain, uh, the, and myositis and pain statistics really aren't available because there's still doctors that say pain isn't associated, the director of a myositis center on the East Coast does tell us that 50% of their patients at their clinic alone experience pain uh, as a part of myositis. Uh, yet patients in other places are still being told uh, pain isn't a part of it. And what's worse is people are not being given any information about ways to understand their pain uh, and how to effectively uh, try and manage the pain. So to empower you with some of this knowledge, uh, Babette Reeves, uh, who is a behavioral health specialist, um, specializing actually in patients with chronic pain and trauma, uh, joins us today to talk about pain and pain management. Uh, this introduction to pain management will cover what chronic pain is and isn't, different types of pain and their importance, and theory, uh, excuse me, one theory of how chronic pain develops, um, the basics of pain how pain management works, and realistic expectations for various treatment approaches. Uh, so as we continue uh, throughout September and hopefully uh, through, throughout the rest of our life at MSU on oh, education and taking action, you know, we wanna arm ourselves and you, uh, uh, you know, our fellow patients with the knowledge helped by listening to the experiences of others uh, to speak up and advocate for ourselves uh, to be sure that we're you know, open to trying available pain management tools. Uh, and the way that we do that is to really understand how it works. So um, with that, I would like to introduce Babette and uh, thank her for joining us today. Hi, Babette. Hey, I'm always glad to be here. Thank you, Jerry, for having me and Lynn. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, one of the things that uh, Jerry left out that I think is helpful to know is that I also have dermatomyositis um, and was diagnosed five years ago, going on six, uh, after about seven years of um, the diagnostic roller coaster, um, although I do believe I've had it longer in my life um, than that. I have been fortunate to have not had tremendous problems with pain. Um, but I think that's also because I've been fortunate to, um, because of the field I work in, I already had some of the tools, um, both, both medical and um, psychological, um, that I, I was kind of able to get out in front of it. I think without those, I would have had a, a lot more problems with pain. I do have some not as severe as many folks do. Um, Today, I like to everybody to have reasonable expectations. Um, if you were with me on the last webinar, I had, it was fairly short as far as what I presented with a lot of time for questions. I know this is a topic where people have lots of questions, um, but I won't, this is gonna be more information loaded this time. I'm gonna give you a whole lot of information there will be time for questions, but one of the tough things about working with chronic pain is that nobody tells us what it is, nobody tells us much about it, and nobody tells us how to understand it. Um, and I really have found working with my patients over the years that once they have a framework and an understanding and some models for how to conceptualize and understand how the tools work because things get suggested to us if they don't make sense. I mean, let's be honest, we're not gonna practice something. We're not gonna do something if it doesn't make sense. 
So today is a lot of the making sense um, um, knowledge. And, but at the end, if you have some more specific questions, we can get into those. Um, as I'm always telling Jerry and Lynn, I'm always happy to come back um, and we can dig into more specific tools and I'll kind of preview some of those um, at the end. So I'm happy to do questions. There will be time at the end, um, type them in. If I do, if you get lost along the way, type something in, Jerry or Lynn will flag me down. And, um, but otherwise, let me just get started. All right. So let's find out why pain is not a four letter word, okay? Let me ask you this. To yourselves, have you ever had, as somebody with chronic pain, have you ever had somebody say that it was all in your head? Or that you're faking it? That it can't really be that bad? Or they tell you, well, you know, if you didn't do this, or if you did do this, you wouldn't have pain. And it can't possibly be every day and this pain thing, you're just making excuses so that you can or can't do this, this, or this. Sometimes it's just an out and out. People find polite ways to say it or imply it, but that you're lying. Um, or that you're avoiding taking responsibilities. Or that it's caused by your, emotion, your emotions, your mental health, or stress. If you have chronic pain, you've probably heard at least some of these, and I hate to say probably most. But there's a foundational principle in pain management today um, that sort of wipes all those off the slate. And that is that all reported pain is real. Whether or not we can get a lab on it, whether or not we can get an image on it, whether or not we can medically explain it, medical providers are being taught and the research supports that if a patient reports pain, that pain is real, whether or not they can put a finger on it or not. So this is a huge shift away from the way pain was approached 50 years ago, even 30 years, 20 years ago which was the whole psychosomatic thing, you know? Oh, you were stressed. Oh, you had emotional stuff going on and that emotional stuff was coming out as pain. And wipe that one out of your, off your slate too. It's not helpful. It's not research-based. We'll talk about how emotions and thoughts do interact with pain, but they're not the cause of pain, okay? So you can stop. One of the helpful things for patients is you don't have to blame yourself anymore. You don't have to feel shame anymore about your pain. And blame and shame never help us feel better or get better or make changes. So your providers should believe what you say about your pain experience because it's your experience. How do they know what you're feeling? Okay, you're the one feeling it. You're the one that knows. And here's what I tell when I train medical providers. I say, you know, if a patient came into you one day for an appointment and said, I was up all night last night throwing up, would you wonder if they were faking it? And they all go, well, no. And I'm like, so why do you do it with pain? Okay. And being believed by family, friends, your support people, your medical providers, your other medical team members being believed is the first step in getting better. What about some myths about chronic pain? Let's clear these up, a few more of these. Okay, kind of answer to yourself, true or false, pain is always a reliable sign of physical damage or injury. That is actually false. Okay? And that's one of the problems and one of the distinguishing marks about chronic pain is that the pain signals that are usually protective and are usually a reliable sign that there's some kind of damage that we need to be protected from, that pain signal has become unreliable. And if this seems kind of weird, go back to some house episode where they did an episode on phantom limb pain. 
And I think in the episode, it was the man's hand, but I often think of it as with a foot. If my leg is amputated below the knee, my left, my left leg, and my left foot hurts, and I report my left foot hurts, it's real. It's called phantom limb pain. We can see it in the pain signaling through fMRI machines, lighten up those parts of the brain. We know that pain is real, but there is no way that foot can hurt because it's not there. That signal is unreliable. And that is a huge thing of what we're dealing with with chronic pain. True or false, when no clear physical damage is found, by diagnostics, the pain must be imaginary. You can probably start guessing a few of these by now. That one is also false. We don't have to be able to find it in order to know it's real. True or false, chronic pain that does not respond to standard treatment should not be taken seriously. The surgery doesn't get rid of it. The PT doesn't get rid of it. The chiropractic doesn't get rid of it. The medication doesn't get rid of it. So we'll blow it off. False. It's still real. We still work at treating it or managing it. Whoops. There's a pill for every ill and when in doubt, cut it out. Well, this was the approach 30 years ago. This is false. We don't have a pill for everything. And surgeons aren't quite as free-handed with surgery because we've learned that it does not always improve the situation for a patient. Pain is a signal to stop moving. I'll let you think about that one for a minute. Okay, this one is a big false. And unfortunately, a lot of providers and a lot of physical therapists don't know this yet. Now, this is when we're talking about chronic pain. So it's been through, you've been through the full diagnosis, you've gotten the go ahead from your medical providers that moving is not going to do you any damage Moving is really necessary and um, therapeutic, okay? But that's not what your brain is telling you. True or false, if you've had pain for a long time and doctors have told you that they've done all they can, your situation is hopeless. I hope you can answer this one by now. It's also false because that's why we're here today because there's a lot that can be done. So what can you expect? First off, you need to expect that some of those pain signals, some of those pain messages are unreliable. When I do trainings and work with patients, we spend a good bit of time on this one. So if you kind of struggle with that one, that's normal. That's okay. The other realistic expectation is that there are no magic bullets. Okay. There's not going to be one fix. And the other realistic expectation is that not only is there not one fix, but even the bits and pieces of fixes are not going to take away all the pain. So we are working to reduce it, not get rid of it all. And by the time we finish today, you'll understand why. Okay. And if you don't ask me that question at the end, it means I didn't explain it well enough, but I want you to walk away with that. Okay. So the goal is to reduce pain, not get rid of pain when we're dealing with chronic pain. The other goal is to increase function. Increase where you are now, be able to do more when you're done with your pain management training. Okay, increase your function. When pain goes down and function goes up, quality of life gets better. Working to minimize risk. And a lot of times that has to do with surgeries, procedures, and medications. And we'll talk about that some more. I already mentioned the quality of life. That's what we're after. And I already hinted at, while there's no magic bullets, we take this little piece and this little piece and this little piece. And if you start adding up pieces, you get some results. And that's what we're after. I think of it as finding the jigsaw puzzle pieces that make up your puzzle so that you get a whole treatment plan, a whole working picture. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit. 
One of the things that's helpful is to understand that there's not just one type of pain, okay? There's actually three main types of pain. The first one is called nociceptive, and I think of it as the broken bone pain, okay? So if you break a bone, if you have a root canal, if you have your appendix out, if you sprain your ankle, um, if you fall down and skin your knee, okay? This is a nociceptive pain. It's kind of something structurally is off, is broken, is out of whack, okay? Nociceptive pain. Neuropathic pain, neuro means nerve, so this is nerve pain. And it's where the nerves are not functioning properly, okay? Picture I have is sort of a, a, an image of carpal tunnel syndrome, another type of neuropathic pain is diabetic neuropathy. The third type is centralized pain. And we'll spend a little more time on this one because with chronic pain, this is super important. But centralized pain is pain that is happening, is being generated from the brain, the spinal cord, and then the rest of the nervous system. But primarily the brain and the, and the spinal cord. Okay, and that's the central nervous system. So it's called centralized pain. Now, here's a couple of interesting facts about these types of pain. Any of these types of pain can be chronic, can become chronic. So acute pain means that it's time limited. You know, you break your arm, you get it set, six weeks later, it's healed up, it doesn't hurt anymore. That's acute pain that first couple of, first week when it hurts, okay? Um, when the root canal, it hurts three, four days, that's acute pain. Um, chronic pain is now defined, it used to be defined as anything that lasted more than six months or something like that. But the new definition is chronic pain is pain that lasts longer than what we expected it to last, okay? So you can have chronic nociceptive pain, you can have chronic neuropathic pain, you can have chronic centralized pain. These types of pain can be experienced in combination. So you can have both nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain, or neuropathic pain and centralized pain. You can have them in any combination. You can have all three. Okay, and that makes a difference, all right? If centralized pain is present, then the other, and you have, say, let's say I have centralized pain, and I know I haven't really told you what that is yet, just hang with me, okay? But if I have centralized pain, which is also called central sensitization, if I have centralized pain and I break my arm, it's going to hurt worse than someone who does not have centralized pain. If I have centralized pain and I get a paper cut, it is going to hurt worse than someone who does not have centralized pain. I am not making that, I mean, when I have that pain, I am not making that pain up. I am not making the intensity of it up. I am not exaggerating. It is not my imagination. My centralized pain has the volume turned up. It is louder. It will feel worse. Each type of pain, one of the biggest takeaways from knowing these types of pain is knowing that, understanding that each type of pain requires a different type of treatment. One of the nitty gritty places where this hits the road is when somebody comes in and they're in pain and they come into our medical clinic and the only medication they know about, and I get this, the only medication they know about is an opiate, okay? My friend's got oxy. He says it's great for his pain. I want some oxy. And it's like, no, we're not giving you any oxy. Hopefully the con we do a better job of the conversation than this, but no, you're not getting any oxy. You know why? Because the doctors figured out that you got neuropathic pain or centralized pain. And opiates don't work for those types of pain. The type of pain is a diagnostic thing and it leads, directs what kind of treatment. 
each one responds better to a different type of treatment. And one treatment for one type of pain will not work for other types of pain. Long lasting pain. Okay, let's say I'm in a massive car accident and I am dealing with pain of one sort or another for months and months and months and months. One of those where it takes a year to recover from this accident, okay? When pain lasts for a long time, we're at more risk for developing centralized pain, okay? So sometimes when people are like, why did this happen? That can be one reason, okay? So long lasting, what starts out as acute pain not very rarely, but can develop into centralized pain if it lasts a long time. Now, if you ask me how long, I don't have any research on that yet, okay? Um, but we know this is a process that happens. So, I kind of mentioned the opiates. Let's talk about opiates, okay? Opiates are narcotic pain medications. So, whether you're talking about oxycodone, oxymorphone, um, I'm blanking on the others. You, we're all familiar with them. Um, why have we cut back on prescribing these? Not because of the addiction issue. Uh huh. I know. I said it. Um, and I'd have a lot of people that would disagree with that. Um, I would have a lot of probably medical people that would not be happy with me saying that. Um, it is certainly part of the picture, but it is not anywhere near the whole picture. It sells commercials on TV, okay? <laughs> That's my opinion. Here's why. I have that opinion. Here's why we don't prescribe opiates as much as we used to, okay? First off, they do not help centralize pain. They just don't work for it. One type of centralized pain is fibromyalgia. So if you have fibro, uh, it, opiates will not help, okay? Even if you have a type of pain that an opiate works well for. So they work well for nociceptive pain, the broken bone pain. So if I break my arm, the doctor may prescribe um, a few days of one of the opiates to help me with my pain. Two other people break their arm also, okay? Only one of us with a broken arm are going to get any relief from that opiate. Only one out of three. Okay. Now I've got that backwards. I'm sorry, I typed that backwards. Okay, I got to change that. One out of three get relief. Okay. And the relief that that person gets is only 30 to 50% reduction in pain. Okay. So if you are prescribed an opiate and your pain does not go away, but it reduces, it's working exactly the way it works, okay? It does not take away all the pain. If you're one of the odd ones that it does, count yourself fortunate. But in the large studies shown that it only helps one out of three people and it only reduces it 30 to 50%. Some of the risks of opiates include you develop depression or your depression gets worse. You're more prone to accidents, falls, automobile accidents. Your judgment is impaired. Your opiates are a nervous system depressant. That means it slows your nervous system down. So everything that goes on automatically in your nervous system slows down, including your breathing. It's called depressed breathing, and that's why over half of the deaths that you hear about from opiates, over half of the deaths from opiates are unintended overdoses. That means somebody takes their medication and it combines with something else, the one beer, or you forgot you took it, so you took another dose, or your metabolism's slower because you're older, and you sit down to watch TV and you doze off and your breathing slows down and you don't wake up. And it really is that serious. 
um, it's a nervous system depressant. That's also why the other automatic system that it slows down is our guts. And that's why constipation is such a problem with opiates, is it slows that system down too. And if you're on opiates long term, that can become a really major problem. I mean, we're talking about overextended intestines and blockages and again, serious stuff. Um, so I've already mentioned the interactions with other medications, substances, unintended deaths, slowed senses and judgment, constipation. Other thing that will happen with opiates is let's say I start on five and it works pretty well for me. And then on down the road, all of a sudden it's not working so well anymore. So doctor bumps me up to 10. Okay, so now that's working back where was before, and then after a while it doesn't work so well. And to keep getting the same effect, the same results, keep having to bump the dose up. That's called tolerance. It's something that happens physically, chemically in the body. This is not a mental thing. This is a physical chemical thing that happens. Unfortunately, with the opiates, you can't keep bumping the doses up. There's a point at which, if you go beyond that point, we have found the risk of this unintended death happening goes up by 80%. We don't want to get you there, okay? Um, finally, and this is the one that most folks don't know that's super important. If you're on opiates long-term, and I can't tell you a time frame for long-term because the individual's bodies are different but bodies will often develop something called hyperalgesia. So if you've been on an opiate a long time and you go in and your doctor starts talking about tapering you off, one of the reasons they're wanting to try this is because you may have hyperalgesia. And hyperalgesia is where your pain medication, the opiate, is creating pain. I'll say that again because it's totally counterintuitive. The medication that you're taking for pain is causing pain. It comes with longer term use and it is a real thing. And when people develop hyperalgesia, if they will taper down off their medication, their pain will lower. So all these things can develop with longer term use. So if these medications have all these side effects and risk, we don't wanna prescribe them unless the benefits outweigh those risks, okay? That's why doctors are much more um, thoughtful and reluctant to prescribe them. So when they're, when they're hesitant or when they're just saying no, it's probably one of these things going on in their head. Ask them about it. Now, let me do the addiction thing real quick, okay? Yes. Opiates are addictive, okay? But what you need to understand is there's two parts to this. I've already talked about the physical dependence that can develop, okay? And physical dependence can make it hard to taper off of them, for sure. You get withdrawal symptoms with physical dependence. But addiction itself is actually about behavior, not about the substance, okay? So not everybody that takes an opiate gets addicted. Addicted is about the behavior, when your behaviors start to revolve around that substance. That's why you can have a shopping addiction. That's why we have a gambling addictions. It's about the behavior. And then sometimes people develop both. They have physical dependence and the behavior piece, the addiction piece. Sometimes they're dealing with both. All right. Moving on, next transition point. So if we're gonna start thinking about how do we work with, what is pain management about? Okay, I've already told you that it's not about finding a magic bullet. It's not about completely and totally getting rid of your pain if you have chronic pain. What is pain management about? Okay. the, the model I like to use is very, very simple, but it's really been a radical shift in treatment. And I call it the three-legged stool. And let me play with it a little bit. If you have a stool and it only has one leg on it, it's not a very good stool, right? 
You're not going to sit on it very comfortably. It's not going to work very well. If you have a two-legged stool, well, you can kind of balance on it a little bit, but it's still not a very good stool. But if you have a three-legged stool, it's a very stable, useful stool. And this is what we discovered in pain management was 30 years ago, 50 years ago, everything in pain management was approached from the P, the physical aspect. So it was what could a medical provider do physically with your body, okay? So surgery, medication, chiropractic, um, acupuncture, massage, physical therapy, all things doing with your body directly with your body. These are the things, I mean, we still do these things. Your medical provider, your PCP, either does these things himself or herself or refers you out for them, okay? But what we discovered was we did the, just the one-legged stool. People got a little bit better for a little while, but not a lot better for a long while. And we want the long while and the lot better. So we discovered that these other two legs were important, okay? And these other two legs, and don't let your brain go, your mind go where it's going to want to go. Stay with me just a minute. The other two legs are emotion and thought. Okay? Emotions and thoughts. Remember, I already said that emotions and thoughts do not cause pain. So that's not what I'm talking about here. But what we have learned, and it's research-based, and every major research medical center in this country does this kind of program, okay? What we have learned is that we can use emotions and thoughts to trick the brain, okay? We can use emotions and thoughts. If the volume on the pain is turned up, we can use emotions and thoughts to turn the volume down. It's just like music on your stereo. The music is still there, even if you turn the volume way down the pain is still there. But if you turn the volume down, it's not hurting your ears like it was when it was cranked all the way up. Now, when your doctor suggests that you go see a therapist like me for your pain, this is what they're talking about. They are not saying you are crazy. They are not saying they don't believe you. They are not saying that you are causing your pain. They are saying, here is this other person that can be on your pain team and that can help you learn some things that will turn the volume down. Okay, let's take this part just a little bit real quick. So if I hit, if I'm hammering a nail and I hit my thumb with a hammer, physically, the P, I'm going to have some changes in my thumb. It might swell. The nail might turn black, I might get a little cut, might bleed a little bit, it's going to throb. Emotionally, I'm going to have some changes. I am probably going to be really aggravated with myself that at my age, I cannot hammer a nail without hitting my thumb. Okay? And hopefully, I'm going to have the thought of how can I hammer this nail without hitting my thumb again. Okay? So, physical, emotion, and thought all happen in that pain experience, but notice that the thoughts and the emotions did not cause the pain. The hammer did. All right. I'm watching my time, and honestly, I think I'm going to have to skip this section, but maybe, hopefully, we can do this another time. So let me talk some more about central sensitization because I want to make sure you leave with a little more information about this. Okay. Central sensitization is actually another name most of the time for most people's chronic pain. Okay. When, let me talk a little bit about what happens when you have something painful happen. Okay. So if I break my thigh bone, Okay, I'm going to feel pain. There's going to be pain signals. My brain's going to process pain. And the brain's going to say, stop moving. Hold still. This is protective. That's what pain is intended for, is to protect us. But 
And, and the reason it protects us when we break our thigh bone is that if I don't hold still and it's a bad enough break, that broken bone can slide over, slash that artery, and, you know, I'm going to bleed out in three minutes. Okay? So it's very protective. Now, if it's not a broken bone and it's chronic back pain and everything has been checked out and there is no possible injury or damage happening. There's not any damage happening if I move, okay? Then that pain signal is unreliable. It's not giving us reliable information that we need to protect ourselves. There's nothing I need to protect myself from with my lower back pain at that stage of the game, okay? And if it goes on for a long time, months and months and months, years, what's going to happen is that when a pain signal comes up, it's trying to protect us from a threat. When we have the brain perceives a threat, the survival part of the brain has all kinds of chemical changes start happening in our body. And these chemical changes get us ramp our body ramped up. Okay, our heart's faster, our breathing gets faster, we've got adrenaline pumping, we've got muscle tension, because our body's getting ready to either fight a danger, run away from it, or freeze and play dead from it. Okay, there's nothing with lower back pain to fight or to run away from. Okay, but all this ramp up is happening in our body. When that happens over and over and over and over again, okay, the nervous system adapts to it. And what it actually does is it grows more nerve cells because there's more nervous signals happening. And um, it wires more things together. And I compare it to, I live in a, a little town of 22,000, okay? And we have a, a four-lane freeway, two north, two south. And if I woke up tomorrow and the town was a million, you better believe they're going to be expanding the interstate. We're going to have to have some more freeway lanes. And that's basically what the nervous system does, is it starts putting in more freeway lanes when there's all such more signaling going on. Well, that expanded nervous system sensitizes our body, okay? Since it, the brain receives more signals, so it becomes more sensitized to these unreliable signals. And that central sensitization, okay? The pain is there. There's an abundance of signals going to the brain. The brain's just flat out processing them as pain. Pain's a threat. I gotta protect myself hold still, do a little panic thing because you're not sure where the pain, where the threat is, and then we get an upward spin. Thoughts and emotions kick in. They can turn the volume up even more, okay? Now, there's a number of things that can cause central sensitization, the length of time that pain happens, trauma, and that's the section I skip. It's my favorite section, but we could do that another time um, because trauma also builds central sensitization. And, um, and there's some other, these hormonal changes that happen over a long period of time. What I want you to understand about central sensitization is it makes everything feel worse and you can use your mind to trick your brain and oh, that those signals are not that threatening. And over time, if it's been wired into sensitization, I can't back this up with research, but I've seen it happen. Over time, with good practice of tools, it can be rewired. It can be turned down. You get fewer signals, nerve cells that aren't used, they unwire, okay? So this is a doable thing, all right? as long as we have realistic expectations of what we're trying to do. Another image of this central sensitization is like having a malfunctioning smoke detector, okay? 
Smoke detectors are supposed to let you know when the house is filling up with smoke, right? That's the way pain usually works. But if I burn a piece of toast, every time I burn a piece of toast, the smoke, my one smoke detector goes off all the time with the least little thing. This is what central sensitization is like, okay? So, in a nutshell, chronic pain is a brain thing. It's a central nervous thing. It's not in your head, it's not in your emotions, it's not in your thoughts. But your thoughts and emotions are your tools for working with it. This long-term ramp up, either from long-term pain or from trauma or two of the big um, causes of this long-term ramp up, make changes to the nervous system. This is called central sensitization and it is a type of pain. Another way to say what's going on is that chronic pain is about systemic. That means through the body, the nervous system runs through the whole body. Systemic changes, autonomic changes, those are those automatic processes that go on in our body and they get dysregulated. They're running higher, they go up and down rat, um, with swings, uh, they get unpredictable, they get unreliable. That's dysregulation, out of whack. Systemic autonomic dysregulation is the big fancy words for it. So, okay, I wanna wrap this up. This is pretty self-explanatory. We start with some kind of pain situation. It leads to some things like tissue damage, inflammation, that leads to us responding. It makes our stress go up. We decrease our activity or get overactive because we're gonna push through it. We don't sleep as well. We don't move as much. We may gain weight. Um, we may get super emotionally sensitive to every little thing that's happening to us. We may, we, we just, we kind of get a little we, we can get a little weird at first when we're having a whole lot of pain and we don't know what's going on. Maladaptive illness behaviors, okay? These lead to, guess what? More tissue damage, more inflammation, more dysregulated sensory processing. Guess what? That leads to more of these other things and you get a pain cycle going and growing. So how, bottom line, do we break that cycle two different ways? And I've already kind of talked about this, just another way of looking at it. You can either have that P side, the physical, the uh, medication, pharmacological, those therapies can break some of those things. They can help with sleep. They can help with overweight. They can help with some of the other behaviors. They can help with stress or the non-pharmacological and can help with the same things. Both of those together are a powerful combination and we just start working with those, what's under that functional consequences of the symptoms. We start working with those things with chronic pain, not with the actual symptoms because we've come to realize that those are just signs of dysregulation. So we need to work with the things that are gonna help moderate the regulation or re-regulate. So what are some things you do if you ever go to a pain management program, okay? You work on things like graded activity, which is a very specific thing. Pacing, those are two huge tools. How to manage tension. I'm not talking about emotional tension, I'm talking about muscle tension because tension causes pain how to regulate. We know ways to work with the nervous system now. Nutrition can make a huge difference, okay? Whole lots of other things. I mean, when I do a really thorough group, I'm doing 24 hours worth of, of pain management tools, okay? There's a lot out there. So, summary, chronic pain is real. It's not caused by stress, emotions, or your mental health. It can be treated, managed, and usually reduced. It takes a team approach with this comprehensive stool. It usually cannot be eliminated. There's no magic bullets. 
Chronic pain and trauma both change the brain, lead to central sensitization. They often, not always, but often go together. The reason I like you to know this is that if you've got a trauma history and you really want your pain to get better, you want your nervous system to get better, you need to treat your trauma also. Effective treatments tailor to the type of pain, use the three-legged stool, the dual focus, treat the functional consequences, basically the side effects, and treat trauma if that's part of the base of how it developed. Finally, there is a difference between pain management and pain specialist. And it's helpful if those terms are getting just kind of thrown around by your providers or your team, it's helpful to get them to clarify which it is that they're really recommending, which it is that they're doing, which your referrals are doing, um, because there is a difference. Um, if I have a, a stomach bug, I'm gonna go see my PCP for a stomach bug. If I have um, Crohn's disease, I'm gonna be going to a specialist, a GI specialist, my PCP is going to be referring me, is the same in the pain world, okay? So your PCP can do a certain amount, um, and, then, and, and a lot of pain management, especially if they have um, behavioral medicine uh, therapist on board. Um, but more extensive things, yes, there are pain specialists out there for that. All right. I do have sources at the end. Jerry is great about posting PowerPoints later. Um, and there's this page especially, I generally is what I recommend to patients if they want to read and work on some things on their own. And let's do some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Bebe. That's very, uh, very helpful, very informative. And Lynn, would you like to? Uh, yeah, I, I'll take the questions. I'll just say that this was, uh, it was, someone said it's fantastic, and it was fantastic. And looking at what you suggested as possible future sessions and what we've already talked about in looking at uh, getting back to the trauma, I can imagine this could be part two of a multi-part series on pain. Right, Jerry? <laughs> So, without, without a doubt. <laughs> without a doubt. So look for more. So we have a couple of questions from Melissa. And one, uh, this was a very good question, but she's wondering if there's a certain certification or special training that uh, we should be looking for in a therapist. Because yeah. I, wish, I wish there was. Um, and there's not. So, but you should be able to ask. Okay, if somebody, if they, if they specialize in it, if they have specific training in it, um, and um, it, it's, it's one of the unfortunate things. I, I went to a National Pain Medicine uh, Association conference two years ago, and, you know, every medical person that stands up there talks about how absolutely important the behavioral medicine part is to people getting to, to feeling better and getting their life back with pain. Um, but there's no, there's no specific training program and certification for it. So I don't understand what that's about. That's one reason I also supply um, uh, several of the resources on the sources page are written for, I say, lay persons, non-medical persons. They're self-help books. They're extremely good. They're basically do-it-yourself programs based on what the big centers do. Um, if you look for a primary care clinic um, that is called integrated care, where they have behavioral medicine, they have therapists as part of the clinic, often those therapists will have um, training in pain management. Um, but again, you'll have to ask. If somebody's got it, they'll tell you yes. If they don't got it, they're going to kind of fudge around about it. <laughs> is that the, is that true for um, like a, just a, I guess maybe like a therapist that has uh, experience in chronic illness? Is that the same? Is there a not necessarily. A lot of uh, therapists that sort of specialize with chronic illness, they um, they may be working more with helping people adjust to having a chronic illness. 
um, you know, to having diabetes, to having uh, an autoimmune, to having um, uh, a long-term cancer, um, you know, to having a, a prosthetic, um, you know, so, so more of that kind of adjusting and day-to-day -day living. So it, it should include chronic pain, but I wouldn't make the assumption that it does. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question, actually, actually, I want to skip, Melissa, I'm going to come back to yours. I'm going to skip to uh, another one from Janine, uh, who says that, you know, she want, uh, would love to have uh, a session on trauma and pain. Uh, but she's also asking, who would you suggest going to see? Would that be pain management also or another health, uh, mental health professional? If you have, if you have a trauma piece, um, that again, you can ask some even more specific questions. You can go to a regular mental health therapist, but if I was calling up and I was wanting to find a therapist to work with, uh, help me work with my trauma history, what I would be asking is, tell me about, do you have trauma specific training? Okay, now there's two phrases out there in the world right now, mental health world. One of them is trauma informed and one of them is trauma specific. Trauma informed is where um, schools, mental health agencies, um, anybody that works with groups of people. I mean, really, they're, they're pushing hard with very good reasons to teach everybody that works there how to work with people in a general sense who might have trauma in their history. Okay, that's trauma-informed. Trauma-specific is where somebody has specific training in how to work with a person healing from their trauma history. And it should be in a particular kind of therapy I mean, it should be, you know, it, they should be able to tell you that they're doing EMDR, they're doing DBT, they're doing sensory motor psychotherapy, they're trained in. I mean, they should be able to tell you what trauma-specific model they are trained in. And then ask them how much training they have, okay? Because there's a lot of one and two day training things out there, but working with training, I mean, working with trauma, um, it's it's pretty specialized uh, for somebody to be really good at it. They've either got to have years of experience um, or they've got to have some pretty in-depth training to be good at it. Um, so those would be the questions I'd ask. Do you treat trauma? What's your trauma-specific training? What modality do you use? How much training do you have? Thank you, excellent. Okay, back to Melissa, and then we'll have one more after this. And that is, could you speak a little bit about nutrition and pain management? And just a teaser for obviously a new a new <laughs> webinar later down the road. But go yeah, ahead. Because it's really funny you should ask that because because that is a I think that is one of uh, my patients' favorite sessions. They love doing the nutrition thing. In a nutshell, here's the first things I tell people to start with. We know certain foods are inflammatory and inflammation can create pain. Inflammation is just where fluid builds up. If you get the cut, if you ever notice when you get a cut, it swells up around the cut, that's inflammation. It's important to the healing, but when it stays there or when there's a lot of it, it increases pain. So you wanna take out anti-inflammatory foods and the simple ones, the simplest, it's not easy to do, but the simplest ones to start with are the whites, okay? So white flour, white rice, white sugar, okay? We know, we know research-wise that white flour, white sugar, and white rice increase inflammation, okay? And I go into specifics about how to do that without driving you and your family crazy, okay? The other is nightshades. And this is where I just, I like to do a session because there's a lot of misinformation out there about nightshades. Nightshades is a botanical class of plants that have a naturally occurring pesticide on their outsides. Okay. And I have a nice research list 
of the nightshades and I'm like, do a two week elimination of nightshades. Nightshades, the big groups are tomatoes, potatoes, sweet peppers like bell peppers, spicy peppers like chili peppers and paprika. I say that because it's in everything now and eggplant. And you cut those out for two weeks and you have to read every bloody label. And I kid you not, there's paprika and mayonnaise now, okay? You read every label, you cut it all out for two weeks. That two weeks, you may not notice much difference. You, you really probably won't notice much difference. But then at the end of the two weeks, when you add, and I suggest just a little bit of one of them back, if you're nightshade sensitive and it affects your pain, you'll know it, okay? Um, and there, there's ways to eat nightshade free without driving yourself and your family crazy either. It's, it's a tough, I mean, it is a tough diet, um, but we know nightshades can increase inflammation in a lot of people and increase pain. Um, and once you go nightshade free, if that's part of your pain, you'll never go back. Um, you, you, somebody couldn't make you eat one of those foods. That's one of those things I stumbled into inadvertently for another reason. It is one of the reasons I think I have less pain than a lot of people with DM um, is because I'm nightshade free. So those are the two starting, easiest starting places with uh, nutrition. Thank you. That's a great teaser. <laughs> uh, okay, we have one more question here in uh, the Q&A from Anne, and that's, if the pain signal is now unreliable, how do I know when I am pushing it, doing a workout, or when I should just push through it? Yes. And that is an absolute right on target, right where we start, fabulous question. Because movement improves pain and if we don't know how to move and how to track ourselves with that movement yes we can cause more pain and you remember those first two tools I had on the list one of them was graded activity and one of them was pacing those are both what those are the answers to your question that's what we use in order to not have that so we can still move to improve our pain but so that we're not making our pain worse with our movement by overdoing it it takes a little bit to teach it there's two different models for it but graded activity and pacing that's how we do it um babette if there was anything that you could provide as far as a first tip for somebody who is living with chronic pain right now and kind of feels stuck what do you think your first tip would be if you haven't had your doctor say to you, you know, your pain is not a sign of possible injury and damage. You are safe. You hurt, but you're safe. Your pain is not signaling a danger. You're not gonna, your pain's not signaling that you are hurting yourself. If you don't know that with pretty good certainty, you need to talk to your medical provider about that and just ask them that question. Okay, if they tell you, yeah, we've checked out this, 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 and, you know, as best as we can tell, I mean, there's no certainties in life and anything. Okay, but, you know, they've checked out everything, or you do have this thing, but it's not going to do any further damage if you're moving, even if you get a pain signal, then when you have that information, then when the pain comes up, you start thinking about central sensitization. This is, yes, this is real. It hurts and it hurts a whole lot. And it's because of central sensitization, not because I'm hurting myself. I'm safe, I'm sore, but I'm safe. I'm in discomfort. Oh, there's the, there's the first thing. Start calling your pain discomfort. Once you know your pain is not signaling damage, drop the word pain and stop, start calling it discomfort. Okay, so that's, the easy, that's one of the kind of ways that we trick our brain? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. Language is super, language is super important to the brain, yeah. We thank you so much uh, for joining us for this and for putting all of that information together because that takes time. So uh, I hope everybody's appreciative of that fact too and uh, that you're living with this disease uh, as well. So 
And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Babette. Enjoy the rest of your evening.